<laughs> I guess you really loved it. Isn't it great? Yeah, and we're so lucky that they showed up for us to do this tonight because these are really great people, great performances, and a great film. So, um, <clears throat> James, we're going to start off with you and talk about how this project came to be. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, as, as most of these people in here probably know, um, there was a billboard for this, this movie, <laughs> The Room. Yep. On Highland for about five years. Maybe what you didn't know is Tommy paid for that for five years. So that's hundreds of thousands of dollars. For there the were also ads on TV. Late, I, I, really I missed late those. Night. Yeah, I, 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 I was single. Would you have to watch? I, would watch and I was awake at four in the morning. What were you watching? They, it? Yeah, there were ads. Probably like public access. Those like bikini shows that we used to be on. Um, but yeah, there were ads on TV as well. So I actually didn't know, you knew it was a movie. I didn't even know it was a movie. I'd see that billboard and it was Tommy glaring down with the room and it, it, the phone number, and it was like, what movie has a phone number? And I thought it was like, I actually thought it was a cult or I thought it was like, like the male counterpart to Angeline or something like that. And, um, I learned later that if you call that number, it went directly to his apartment, and he would be like, hello, just go see my movie at Sun Sunset Five. You didn't even need to call the number to go see the movie. It was just also there. Just, <laughs> if you really want to talk. Yeah. I hope you like it. So I, that's all I knew. I didn't know about the room, and it be, had become this phenomenon at Sunset Five, uh, and it took about six years, and then it caught on, and... <laughs> Uh, Entertainment Weekly and CNN and everyone covered it and then it spread across the country, but I still hadn't seen it and then I read the the book, The Disaster Artist, when it came out about four or five years ago that was written by Greg um, Davies character and, and Tom Bissell and um, I was immediately just taken by it. Like, you know, like the hairs on the back of my neck like stood up like this is incredible. Not only you know, because I love Hollywood stories, but this was like a Hollywood story unlike any other, obviously, <laughs> like, you know, it's an insane character. But, in, but at the same time was still like very universal, like everybody, you know, I'm sure everybody in here, or everybody that comes to LA, you know, to follow their dreams can understand what it's like to start, you know, start at the bottom. You, you come here and you're, you know, nowhere and you, and you want to make it in and, Everybody can understand that, whether you're in movies or not. And um, Dave, this is the first time that you and your brother have worked together in a feature? First time in a real way, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he jokes that I um, said no to him for many, many years, but that's the truth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was just waiting for the right project and um, <clears throat> the right kind of dynamic. Like he. We, I don't know if you guys have seen this uh, thing we did about 10 years ago now called Acting with James Franklin yes. on but um, it's basically him as an acting teacher uh, shitting on everything I'm doing and no matter what I do, him making fun of me and uh, it just felt like a similar-ish dynamic and uh, but no, it was really fun we, we, uh, we have very similar sensibilities and um, he's a really great actor's director he, he puts a lot of time into casting and uh, once he casts all the right people he's pretty hands off he, he really encourages the actors to just trust their instincts and so hopefully we uh, get to work together for a long time and, and uh, Seth you and James were working together when he first decided to to do this project, and then he said, okay, come do this with me. Yeah, we were making the interview in Vancouver. Oh. Uh, oh. Yeah, nice, never thought that would happen. Uh, <laughs> shocking response to that. Uh, and, uh, nice, look what, look what time does. Um, and, um, <laughs> We, uh, yeah, and, and James was reading the book. I had seen the movie pretty close to when it came out um, with Jonah. Me and Jonah saw it together uh, at, the, at the Sunset Lemley. We had seen the billboard, and uh, we wanted to go check it out. The theater was, like, almost empty. It was, like, around the time that there was, like, just starting wow, to be people. You could tell, like, 
like like a few of the things had caught on. There was maybe like ten things throughout the movie that people shouted out, um, but it was not. Were there spoons? There was spoon. The spoon was an Alcatraz. That was those ones were like I think the first ones basically. Um, but it was something I've been obsessed with for a really long time. I think Paul Rudd was honestly the first one that we any of us knew who saw it. He was a very early adopter of the room. Um, and uh, but yeah, then James mentioned that I saw him reading the book and we would talk about it. And then in Vancouver is where you actually saw the room for the first time, right? Or, yeah, I have to say. I give that to the Canadians. They know really how to do the room. Yeah, they do like, the room well, the Canadians. They're they generally the very most timid. Moves, yeah. The most footballs, <laughs> most tuxedos. We don't get out much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and so he had talked about how he wanted to make it into a movie, and um, we were all, we were just so excited about the idea. And we were like, we will do anything we can to help you do that. It was just such a great story. Um, yeah, that we, you know, to me what was the most interesting thing about it, and probably the thing we talked the most about it, is like, it's a bad movie, but we love it. <laughs> and like, and like what they say, like, I've seen this movie more than I've seen like, you know, like some of the best movies of all time, you know, like, like I've seen Citizen Kane like three times, I've seen this like ten times or something like that, and, and, and we were making a movie about it. And so we also couldn't act like it was this stupid bullshit, because we're like, then why are we making a movie about it? <laughs> like, we have to address the fact that there's something very worthy about it, and very good about it, and very um, pure about it, whatever it is, watchable. I mean, there's tons of bad movies that we weren't spending a lot of time and energy making a movie about the making of. And so what we... <laughs> To me, that was kind of like the most interesting conversation that we kept having and what was the thing I related to the most is like, what, when something succeeds for the completely different reasons than you wanted it to and, and why it was okay for us to love this thing even though it was bad and what, and like, just that whole dynamic was very interesting to, to me. I've, I've literally seen The Room more than any movie ever made, and, <laughs> and like, it, it gets to a point where, like, like what Seth was saying, if a movie's that watchable, like, when can we just start calling it a good movie? Yeah, yeah. is it bad? Yeah, I don't know. It's not what he wanted it to be, but it's not, on, it, it's incredibly watchable and fun and entertaining, and so, yeah, that's really interesting to, to me. And what was it like meeting Tommy? In person. Well, it was such a tricky thing. I, you know, I, I've, play, I've done a lot of movies that um, are based on real people and played characters based on based on real people, and it's always uh, it's different from project to project. I remember on One Twenty Seven Hours, you know, I uh, Danny Boyle was very particular. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me clap with one hand for that movie. <laughs> uh, Sound of one hand clapping. That's, that's a dirty joke. Uh, um, but Danny Boyle was very particular on that. It was like, we'll meet with Aaron, the real Aaron, before and just you know talk to him for days and days, but that we won't have him on set so that we can have our own experience of it. Frankly, with Tommy, we read the book and we're like, this guy's insane. Like, this guy cannot, does not know how to behave on a set. Like, he should not be on our set. And uh, so we, but we probably can, don't, don't feel bad for him. He's like, yes, he's, uh, Greg, Greg was welcome. He's, he, he understood. But then one of the, um, his biggest oh uh, stipulation in his contract was that he get a cameo in the movie and that he play opposite me. But he didn't read his contract very well. And what it said was, all we had to do was shoot it. We didn't have to put it in the movie. And it's in there. You just watch. Just it. wait. Yeah, you just don't awe him. Why is in there? Yeah. So we kept, you know, slightly suggesting like. Maybe you want to be in a scene opposite Greg. Like there was some, there was a whole sequence that took place in Romania that got cut out. But we're like, we know you, we know you're from New Orleans, but maybe you want to be in the Romanian sequence. And like, no, no, how to be opposite James? I want to opposite. You know, I can 
And so we're like, all right, fine. And so we, we wrote this scene that you that you saw at the end of the credits that we didn't write. Actually, we didn't write all that. Was all time. We just we just had two lines. Like he comes and talks to Jay and to my Tommy at the at the thing. And um, first of all, he 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 texted me two days before. Oh, yeah. And he was like, obviously in lens crafters, because there's all these glasses behind him, but he was like, he's, he's trying on his glasses, he's like, what do you think of these glasses you like for character? I'm like, it's fine, I don't know, it's fine. And, and then he had, he had drawn on a mustache with big pen, and he, and he texted, you know, you like mustache? I draw it on better when we shoot. <laughs> Don't worry. I use better pens. I, yeah. I, use, I use a Sharpie for the shoot. And so we're like, all right, we'll get you a mustache, dude. But obviously, like, when he's, and then he's like, I want my character to be named Hanrei. And we're like, all right, he's Hanrei. And so we, I, I, that was all before I had ever met him face to face. And we're, I was like, I'll get you a fake mustache, you want a fake mustache, et cetera. And he, so we had no idea what he's going to be like. We're all there, Seth's there, everybody's there. And he shows up and he was actually like really sweet. Yeah. And he like actually won Seth over. Like He was adorable. I was really worried about it, yeah. I was like, he's gonna be fucking crazy, basically. The, the mustache drawing picture was not like a good indicator. Uh, and then... And then he came in and was really shy. It was like, and, and was nice. It was, oh, hey, how are you? You know, and he was very, well, what's also weird is James directed the movie in character, basically. So, uh, so when Tommy came to set, James was interacting with him as Tommy. Because he was There's a whole interview that has not aired anywhere yet of me interviewing Tommy as Tommy. As Tommy. And what's weird about that is it didn't throw Tommy at all. Like, he, I, don't even, I don't even think he mentioned it. Like, he was like, oh, hi, Tommy. And he's like, oh, hi, James. And he was just like, so here's how we do see. Okay, cool. And like, it was, it was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen happen in my life, honestly. Uh, yeah. And then, and then he, and then I interviewed him. I'm like, uh, so are you gonna, you're gonna direct any more movie, Tommy? And he's like, yeah, I have this movie, very controversial. It's uh, called American Star. It's like that movie, American Gigolo, except is with gay, is gay, gay sex. Very controversial. <laughs> There's never been a movie about, you know, people, gay people having sex. And, <laughs> and then Seth, Seth goes over to me later, he's like, hey, I, uh, I gotta, I would do that. I'd do that for a I'd do Tommy's movie for a day. We should, we should talk to him and we go up to him. I was like, yeah, that's kind of a cool idea. Let's, that's a, that'd be a good experience. And we go up to him, we're like, Tommy, so this movie, uh, American Stud, you know, uh, we kind of want to do it. We want to do a day or two. He's like, he had to think about it. He's like, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> and then uh, we're like, what's the. What's the budget of American Studies? Like, yeah, 20 million. <laughs> well, that never get made. Yeah, that, that wasn't happening. Yeah. Tommy also was not that thrilled that you were playing him in the movie at first. He, he Didn't he want Johnny Depp at first? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well... <laughs> I was his second choice. I, <laughs> because solid second choice. I think for the single reason that I had played James Dean, and as you, you know, he quotes James Dean's Rebel Without a Cause in the movie, you're tearing me apart, Lisa, right? So I think because I had played James Dean, I was his second choice. But I, I did have to talk to him on the phone he in Vancouver with Greg to get the life right. So I had talked to him. And there wasn't much to say to him, so I, you know, I, I, what, what am I going to tell him? Like how I'm going to direct the movie or whatever. And I, I knew I wanted to play him, but I didn't have the contract yet, so I didn't want to suggest that in case you know he wanted someone else. And and so he goes, so who play me? And uh, <laughs> I was like I don't I don't know, Tommy. Who who do you who do you think? He's like, wow. Well, how about Johnny Dow? And I'm like, <laughs> and I laughed, and he's like. Why are you laughing? I'm like, I don't, I, I don't know, Tommy. He's like, <laughs> biggest movie star, you know, in the world. He's like, okay, okay. And he, he, we keep talking. And he goes, I go back to before, you know, 
I say, Johnny Depp, you, why are you laughing? And I'm like, all right, dude, this guy isn't going to let this go. I'm like, all right, dude, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Johnny Depp, okay? And he's like, yeah, you don't go down the road. You don't know what I end of alley, okay? I'm like, okay, okay. And then Greg said, because he knew, because I guess I learned, I, I learned later, he and Tommy had actually watched my version of James Dean like a bunch of times. So Greg was like, how about you, James? You can play Tommy. And I'm like, you know, kind of sheepishly like, yeah, may yeah maybe, maybe. And uh, he's like, yeah, James, I see something. I see your stuff. You do some good things. You do some bad things. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Thanks. Good from you. Thanks. And, uh, and then he's like, yeah, okay, maybe. And then maybe I'll direct you someday, eh? I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so what does he think of the movie? Did he see the film? That's a whole... That was crazy that, night also, oh. yeah. <laughs> That's a whole thing. We, um... <laughs> oh, show it. You have he came to South by. We, we had a... he didn't want to see it. We were we offered to show it to him in private. But he did not want to see it until we took it to South by Southwest. Yeah, and then we watched it with him, which was weird, in a theater full of people like this, and you're basically like sitting with like a thousand people like like <laughs> laughing at a guy, kind of, at times, but also really sympathizing with the guy, and I think he appreciated that. And But we um, didn't, we, you did not know, like we were all looking down the row at him. Yeah, and everyone, you could just see us all <laughs> glaring down. And then at the he end... He wasn't laughing, like no, he wasn't laughing. He was soaking it in. Yeah. And then we had dinner, we hung out with him for like two hours afterwards, and no, 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 no. It was the whole thing. Because <laughs> we were, we were yeah, fretting. You were first. <laughs> yeah. We were fretting. We were like, there's no way we can bring him up on stage for the Q&A. Oh, that's so right. Like, <laughs> just, worst, worst case scenario, he comes on stage and he says, none of that's true. I don't like this. I don't endorse yeah, it. Yeah, we don't know what the fuck yeah, he's going to yeah. say. He could just come up and be like, it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. <laughs> but he also says, like, Greg Book. You know, only 40% true. Like, we're like thinking, like, well, we based our movie on the book, dude. So, so we had no idea. And we go up on stage and we're doing the QA. I mean, it was an awesome, awesome screening. Um, and, and then the audience asked some questions, and this guy comes up and he asks a question. And he goes, Oh, by the way, I played the real Chris R in the room, the Zach Efron character. And he's like, can I get a picture? And Seth's like, yeah, dude, come on up. And he gets up on stage, and I'm looking out at Tommy, and it's like a dark cloud. And I'm like, I, and I don't, I still haven't talked to him. I don't know if he hated the movie, or he's jealous that this dude's up here getting the attention or whatever. And so I, I'm like, Tommy, why don't, you, why don't you come on down? And he won't come. And so the whole audience stands up and starts chanting his name, like in our movie. And so, you know, obviously probably love that. And he, like, <laughs> comes up. And my biggest regret of the night is we didn't give him the mic on stage because we still didn't know. And I step off stage. <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> and I'm like, all right, Tommy, what you, do what you think? And he's like, well... I approve 99.9%. Why didn't you say that for them? But the 0.1% is the weirdest fucking yeah. thing ever. <laughs> so this, so I ask him, what's the 0.1%? And you think he's gonna say, look, I never did that, or I didn't say that, or whatever. He goes, um, Director to director, you know, he goes, uh, I think you should look at lighting and beginning a movie. <laughs> a little off. Yeah, we're too shaky sometimes. <laughs> like, I'll tell Brandon, the DP, to watch the room for his appointment. And, but then, later, this, is, this says everything about Tommy. We were just with him in Toronto for the uh, TIFF, and... That was actually the most time I'd ever spent with him, and he's he's a little. I love the guy, but he I realize is crazy in a whole different way than I even thought. But he, I had told that story in a couple of interviews, 
And I guess he had heard them or whatever, and he didn't like how he came off or whatever. So he rewrote history, and now he says, no, the point one percent. It's not lighting. I never say that. I'm like, Tommy, dude, I will never get to forget that. Like, you said that. He's like, no, I never said that. I say, the point one percent is because the way you throw football. I don't throw football. Like that. <laughs> and that's him with the room. Like, when he made the room, he said, you know, this is going to be a Tennessee a drama on the level of Tennessee William. People who watch this movie, they won't be able to sleep for two weeks after watching this movie. You know, I, they, they'd be so disturbed. And then, from the premiere on, people were laughing, and he rewrote, you know, history, and he said, you know, the room, now he says, the room is safe place. You can laugh, you can cry, do whatever you like, just don't hurt yourself. <laughs> Did he make up with Greg? Did he make up with Oh, oh yeah. Are they still friends? Oh, they're like... They're very close. <laughs> but today is, I don't think I'm... No, I don't know if I'm not going to... I don't think I'm not going to... I don't know what you're going to say, but just... <laughs> Tommy demanded that they share a hotel room. People, they went to the door and Tommy showed up in his underwear. <laughs> They're good friends. <laughs> but no, after after Greg saw an early cut of our movie for the first time, um, I think it just kind of helped. Like he's been he's been in touch with Tommy ever since they made the, the movie originally. But after seeing our movie, I think he started to see Tommy in a different way, and you like sympathize with him. And mm. literally the next two weeks, he went off and he wrote a movie for the two of them. So there's a movie called Best Friends Best with friends. parentheses around the R. <laughs> Best fiends. Uh, very clever. It's so. Uh, Probably coming out early next year. Yeah, probably. But no, uh, no. The latest on that is uh -oh. it's uh, Kill Bill style. <laughs> oh, it's so long they cut it into two. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those best friend necklaces now broken in half. Uh, they, well, but what's originally in the script? Actually, the movie ended with kind of. Tommy and Greg, like, not being friends, and, like, them kind of going off in their own separate ways, and dramatically, we thought that was kind of interesting, and then as we were making the movie, we saw they were still best friends, and that they talked on the phone all the time, and that every day, every day, and we were just like, we can't pretend they're not friends, like, they are, and so we rewrote the movie to reflect the reality that despite all that shit, they they were best friends still. Um, and it actually made it a much better ending, but it was not our instinct. We thought it would seem much fancier if they didn't become friends at the end. <laughs> they were like, oh, that'll get us much better ratings. Yeah. <laughs> Something I thought that you all handled really well in the, in the film, for me anyway, was we don't want to really laugh at other actors, and you really didn't do that and make fun of, uh, of him, even though it was funny to see the scenes and certain things. He was treated like a really respectable person who had made it, you know, made a film and had gone out and done this. Well, as Seth was saying, I mean, that was, that was really our, our way in to, you know, not... I think the I think the, the the bad version of this movie is to to just make fun of them or make this a spoof, and what and we were really kind of you know cued in by the the book and the way the book was written and one of the things that I love so much about the book is that um, what could have just been a series of very funny anecdotes about how many mistakes and how crazy that shoot was. Um, that was really crazy. It was, but like that, it, it was actually this very universal, yeah. very relatable story, right. and um, and I I relate to Tommy. I mean, I I know I, in some ways more than I'd like to admit, but I I do like um, he's a dreamer. He's a you know he's somebody that that um, just wants to achieve his dreams as, as and anybody you know everybody can relate to that and um and that was really our our approach and i think that's one of the special things and it was and it was really hard to do eventually like tonally it's a it's a really difficult line to walk even down to like the score i remember having conversations about the score like we can't do comedy music right. here we you know that's again can it be, you know, suggest we're like poking fun at them? Yes. So even if you li if you listen to the score, it's actually not a comedic score. Um, 
but he, he was kind of touching upon this, but like, as an actor, you know, when, when you're first starting out, things suck, and we can all relate to, you know, we can really relate to these guys, and it's one of these things where, like, I look back on my career, and I've been on sets where I think, you know, literally people are on set, like, talking about awards, and this is like gonna fucking, you know, break through. And then the movie comes out, and not only is it not good, it's a piece of shit. <laughs> and like, it's one of these things like, I've, I've talked to a handful of my friends who who work, you know, doing, doing this type of thing, and they've said that after seeing our movie, it kind of made them sad in a way, because they, yeah. they look back early on in their career, even now, yeah. where when you're on a set, you know, you gotta give it everything you have, and there's moments where it's like, is what I'm doing brilliant, or is this a fucking disaster? And it's like such a fine line, you just throw yourself into it, and like, we've all been there, and so that was like, you know, a huge reason why we related to these characters. <laughs> To right. trust your director, and you did a great job, I think, in directing this film. Yeah. 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 Well, I had, I mean, this is maybe more insider baseball, but, you know, it's sack, so I'll tell you. Um, um, <laughs> Seth and I started on Freaks and Geeks with, with Jedi. Uh, and what I really loved about um, the system that Judd really set up, um, really it, it kind of happened for Seth and I after Freaks and Geeks, but like, I remember on Knocked Up, I had a little cameo in that, and seeing this system where, you know, there's a lot of improvisation, and there's writers that sit behind Judd, and, you know, write jokes and, and pitch it, and it's like an open set, the actors can improvise, or Judd will throw out ideas, or the, the writers behind him will give him notes. And um, and so Seth and, and, and Evan Goldberg, you know, Seth was obviously acting in it, but, you know, Evan would be behind Judd. And it was like this amazing sort of apprenticeship system. And then by Pineapple Express, Seth and Evan were producing it and writing it. And then it was, and I saw that from there, it was such an easy step for them to go and direct This Is The End. Like, they had essentially been, you know, going along for the whole process on several movies, and then on This Is The End, there were other writers, you know, Ariel and Kyle, who then, you know, went on to do Sausage, write Sausage Party, and, and they have a series coming out, Future Man and all that. And so, for me to, you know, this wasn't the first thing I directed, but I had worked with Seth in, in that fashion for, for so long that it was actually really familiar and easy to kind of do that. And, and, and when you act and direct yourself, I always said, and I have a show on, on HBO now too, The Deuce, where I, I play two characters, I play twins and direct. Like, you need... <laughs> great producers and collaborators around you. Otherwise, you're just, you know, stuck in that mode, again, is inside baseball, but like you're stuck in that mode of like acting and then running to the monitor and watching, it. it's just like, if you have the people around you that you've worked with and you trust and everybody's in sync, then you then you can all just depend on each other and it's, and it, and you can just okay. sort of go play musical chairs in a very, and it's very fluid. So There's some, yeah, because I think you're absolutely right. I want to ask you about the transformation to Tommy. So, so many physical things were done, hours were spent doing noses and cheeks. And would you talk about that? Yeah, well, that was the other thing. I always knew that I wanted Davey to play Greg, that, you know, um, I've known Davey all his whole life. <laughs> <laughs> but, um,. <laughs> Long-time fan here. I'm glad I could finally get him to do one of my movies. And, uh, but that the characters weren't brothers, but I knew that if I played Tommy, I would look so different than him that it wouldn't matter. Um, and so we had to work that out, and, and so we just did some tests, and it was like, it was a lot of prosthetics, and so it was like cheeks and nose and eyelid, lazy eyelid thing, and chin, and wig, and 
contacts and it was like it was like two and a half hours every morning and I was the director so it was like getting there early every so I I, I got there even earlier than I would have had I just been acting and um, and yeah, they say I, I sort of stayed in character while I was <laughs> directing. I couldn't deal with it straight up for the first like two days of filming. Like every time you came up to me, I was just like, I can't even fucking talk to you, man. Like I like I could not deal with it. And people would come to sit all the time and be like, Where's James? And I'd be like, He's right, fucking, okay, he's right there. And then like my wife really hated it. She like could not. She would just be like, I don't like it. I don't want to go near it. I just don't, I just don't like talking to him when he's like... I think your grandparents came and I like My grandmother them. came and they were just, my grandmother just did not get what the fuck was happening. Like, she was just like, I thought James Franco was in this movie. I was just like, I can't explain prosthetics to you. It's a whole thing. Like, um, yeah, it was, it was jarring for people. I would, but then it, it was funny. Like, Once you got used to it, you totally forgot. And, you, and then new people would come and act. And every new person that came. Every new person you would like, I would forget and then like Zac Efron would show up and he would just be like, what the fuck? And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, Franco's in character all the time. It looks like totally crazy. Uh, you should know that. And then like I would warn people sometimes. I remember sometimes people would come and I'd be like, before you show up on set, you should know. It's going to be jarring at first and just, you can laugh at it. It's okay. Just laugh at his face. I did it. It's fine. Like, you'll move past that and then, yeah, then you'll get used to it and be able to do with it, but it was not easy to deal with. <laughs> but your accent, which is so wonderful. <laughs> and so, I mean, this to me, this is like the new, you know, Tony Montana from Scarface. Like, it's such a fun accent to do, and everybody's got a Tommy, you know, but um, Tommy, you know, impression. But, um, you know, I had. The ironic thing is he loved James Dean and he has this weird, I mean, God love Tommy, he has this weird inner struggle where I think he really thinks that he is, you know, James Dean, you know. Um, uh, but I, having played James Dean, worked on Tom playing Tommy in the exact same way that I did James Dean, where it's like, watch his work <laughs> over and over again. Uh, uh, the room is a little different than like East of Eden, but <laughs> watch the room over and over again. And more than that, I had a great, the real Greg gave me a gift on this movie that as, a, as an actor, I've never had anything quite like it. I mean, I, the only thing I can compare it to is like Aaron Ralston, when he was in, you know, when he was trapped, he made those actual videos that we depicted in the thing, and I don't think he's shown the all of them to, to the public. He showed them to me, and so it was like seeing that guy at his most vulnerable private moments. Wow. I kind of got something like that with Tommy, where way back in the day, we're talking before Tommy made the room, he would record everything. He would record every phone conversation, which he actually does in the room. Like, he recorded, like, uh, my girlfriend cheating on me, I record the phone conversation. Like, he actually did that for every phone conversation he had with Greg and whatever. Oh my God. And in addition to that, he would re record himself. He would just talk to himself on a re recorder. He would drive around L.A. and he would talk to himself. Yeah. I don't know why. And um, <laughs> he knew one day we'd need an expositional tool as we were making a film about him. We actually had it in the movie, and it yeah. seemed too easy expositionally. You're like, no one would drop around and do that. Just say what they're thinking. <laughs> but he did. And then Craig, again, not knowing that we would ever do this movie or again, that he would give me these tapes had stolen some of those tapes years ago. And now Tommy knows that I have them, okay? So I'm not like being a super dick, but, um, but Greg gave me those recordings and it's this dude. So it was not only did I get to listen to the accent, I would, I would drive around and listen to Tommy, and, you know, and do it. Wow. But I had him in his most private moments, like talking to himself. And it was like 
so revealing and just talking about his dream. He, actually, he did a lot of complaining about acting classes. Like, that teacher don't understand me. Like, he tell me do scene in French. Why would I do scene in French? I, I sound fine. Like, you know, and like, you know, a lot of complaining about acting teachers. But um, it was it was such a gift as an actor. Like, get your character in his pro most private, you know, talking to himself. Wow, let me just ask you. It was like a, it was as if I had a, a diary, but like the audio book of a diary or something. <laughs> I'm asking Kelly, what are you saying to me? Right, I was just going to ask him that. Okay, just want to make sure. Didn't mean to cut you off, but we have mics, please, and we don't have to repeat. Please go to the mic, because it gives you more face time with the talent, really. Hello. Um, sorry. Uh, first off, uh, I love this movie. You guys are amazing. Uh, I'm really upset though, because when I was 13 years old, I thought, man, I want to make the movie about making the room. There's a lot of people that have come to us and said that. <laughs> but I always thought that it would be you to play Tommy. Oh, wow. Why did you think that? Because <laughs> <laughs> you're the best actor ever. That's oh, thank you. Can do it. Um, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to know, because uh, of course I want to uh, make movies. What's the best advice you can give to a director for working with actors? Because especially in this movie, you see the way not to do it, really. So no, I mean, come on, but yeah. What would be the best way? Um, one thing I learned, so I, I started acting when I was about 18. I did Freaks and I was, I didn't know how lucky I was at the time to do Freaks and Geeks um, when I was about 20, 21. And then, after I'd been working about 12 or 15 years as an actor, I went back to film school at, at NYU and to, went to grad school. And I, I had been on a lot of sets. A lot of my classmates in that program hadn't been on sets or hadn't been on many sets. And what I realized is, um, you know, and then they were making we were making short films, and they had, and in a lot of their films they had fairly inexperienced actors, which is fine, you know, everybody's learning and, and all that. But I realized it was teaching them how to direct in a, in a weird way where like they had to over direct, you know, that the, the, the actors didn't quite know. And so they had to get in there and sort of direct too much in a way with the actors. Hmm. And I had worked, you know, at that point I had worked with incredible people. I did 127 hours when I was at NYU. And so I worked with great directors, and most of my favorite directors will always say, like Marty Scorsese, and all of them will say, like, or Altman, who I worked with, or Mark Rydell, or whatever, will be like, you know, if you don't have to say anything to the actors, don't, you know what I mean? But that only comes when you work with great actors and they, you know, find it. So I guess that's, that's my rule, like, if I don't have to say anything, it is, you know, it's a collaborative medium. That's That was Tommy's downfall, I think. Like, he had been told his whole life, no, 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 right? So the only one that was gonna get his movie made was him. He had to will that into to being. But then once he was on the set, he kept that attitude of like, it has to be my way, I have to, you know, it has to be, you know, because that's what he learned. But he was working in a collaborative medium. So that's one of the reasons he made all that. He should have listened, like, no, Tommy, you don't need to use the HD camera and the 35 millimeter at the same time. Like, you should have listened. His sad, ironic success tragedy is that all his mistakes turned into gold, and so now he's trapped in that mode forever. Like, he'll just, you know, always think my way the right way. But, but I, I learned that if you can collaborate, if the actors can bring more than what you thought, let them be and, 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 and don't, don't direct. Yeah. Thank you. And I just really, really quick need to know, whatever happened to the Bukowski, the, uh, Bukowski movie? I think that's how you pronounce the, uh, the author. Uh, whatever happened to that movie? Because I've always wanted to see it, and I don't know. I have a lot of, I have a lot of movies that I've made that are... Uh, It'll come out someday. <laughs> Thank you. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's about Buka Charles Bukowski's childhood. Oh. Hi, I just have a quick question. It's about the scene with Brian Cranston. Was that really true? Um, I think 
Greg did get an offer on on something. It was not it Malcolm. Malcolm. It was not Malcolm. Little Malcolm. With little, little Malcolm. Um, I I love the idea that we would have Brian Cranston circa early 2000s pre Breaking Bad, and you know Brian Cranston from Malcolm in the Middle, and then it would be that. So that's that's why we use Brian Cranston on that. Thank you. Yes, over here. So um, I find it interesting. Uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for being here. That's really amazing. Yeah, so appreciate it. Um, I find it fascinating that just even in this Q and A, there's a there's a disparity between the way you guys talk about Tommy and even the way he's shown. Like it's he's almost more bizarre and erratic in, in real life than when you portrayed somehow. Um, <laughs> is that the same? Yes. So my, my question is. Um, and then there's also interesting things that sort of get brought up in the film, like the way in, you know, I guess he was having a bad day and was kind of uh, throwing Lisa around and, and, and kind of being really harsh on her. There's a lot of interesting yeah. things in the original, in the room in general, sort of, you sort of get a sense of his opinion on women even. Um, so I kind of wonder, in making this film, are you worried that you're putting on a pedestal and making a hero out of somebody who is in fact a villain? Look, the room, the room is, it's 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 grossly misogynistic. I mean, it's, it's it, you know it's it's messed up. Um, I think there are aspects of Tommy that we don't hide from. I mean, we show we don't you know we show Tommy being messed up in that scene. Like we're not we're not painting him in a good light in that scene. That's his. He's breaking down. He's insane in that scene. Um, I think what we're trying to celebrate is the dreamer in, in Tommy and the outsider artist in Tommy. But he's he's definitely flawed. He's not, you know, and and we didn't hide from that. You know, we, we did try to show the warts. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I can do one more question over here. Yes. I just wanted to say how much I love you guys so much. All the enjoyment you give me from the films I've seen. I just love them. I, I just love you guys. I, I want to some Anyway, if possible, I just noticed I get hundreds more hits if I get a, get a picture with you later. I'd love that. Thank you. Uh, how about a real question? <laughs> no plugs, no plugs. Okay. Oh, all right, we'll Let's you. do a question. One question. Over I know that you teach. I know you run a school. Will you please teach the room to do Tommy, please? <laughs> how do you do, if you said, okay, because it's, it's the holy costume of the year. But you gotta go to New Orleans for several months. <laughs> James, come on, teach go to the Bayou to do Tommy. What's the essence of doing the Tommy? <laughs> I mean, it's just it's here's here, here's here's what I would teach. It's this, it, when I say it, it was just like James Dean. James Dean and Tommy are different than doing Aaron Ralston, who's also a real guy, and because. They are actors, and so their physical behavior, the way that they look, the outer part of the character is much more important than it, than it was with Aaron Ralston. Nobody really knows or really cares what Aaron Ralston sort of looked like. I mean, we did it. We made, you know, I looked like him. I dressed like him. And... Um, and all that, but that that performance was more about the experience that the character went through, rather than capturing Aaron, every mannerism that Aaron Ralston had. But with actors, the audiences, you know, probably know their films or can go watch the film. So the outer behavior is very important. So you go and learn that. You know, you practice. I mean, one of the reasons that I stayed in character is you want the, the accent and the behavior to be as natural as your own behavior. So it's not, you're not putting it on. So you just practice that. So whatever you need to practice, you watch his movies, get the, get the mannerisms, he sort of, yeah, there was a lot of behind the scenes footage too. Like I just noticed things like, he just sort of, like when he walked, his arms would always, it was like weird. His arms would always stay like, like that. And, um, just you look for the little mannerisms and then, you know, you get to practice the voice and all those things. But for it not the plur he has like plurals, he has trouble with plurals. Yeah, yeah, everything. You just listen, you listen to it over and over and make it your own. 
Um, but then, to make it not a you know a Saturday Night Live sketch, um, you need to get the inner life, and that's one of the things you know you have to understand what's motivating him and you know why he's doing these things and why you know why he's this way, and that's that's how you get a rounded character. Okay, I'm sorry I'm the bad guy here. Unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to them. Thank you so much. Where is it? Where is it?